Father, this morning we praise you because you have given us reason to, to worship. You are the reason that we're here. You've given us life and hope and peace through our Savior, Jesus Christ. And today we want to praise you. Today we want to yield our lives to you and we ask that we would hear your voice, we would sense your presence, and that we would hear your truth that will change our lives. In Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. I'm going to invite you to take your Bibles or your Bible apps and turn to Matthew chapter 5. If you don't have a Bible or a Bible app uh, on your device, then uh, grab one of those in the pew around you. Feel free to use it. If you don't have a Bible, feel free to take it. We want you to have the Word of God and let it change your life. Hey, uh, I just got to mention this. Uh, uh, Got a little secret that I want to share with you guys. If you don't like uh, fighting the parking or trying to figure out where you're going to sit because it's dark when you get in here and all that kind of stuff, we've got two services on Saturday at 4.30 and at 6 that are not nearly this crowded. (laughs) And the parking lot is not nearly this crowded. And I share that because we love it. Whatever service you come to, we love it. But you may be one of those that has some flexibility of schedule and goes, you know what? I could make Saturday either one of them because they're running about the same exact attendance. Either one of them my service and open up some seats and some parking for maybe some of our guests that haven't found us yet. So I just mentioned that because I would love for you to find a place that that fits your schedule, your time, where you don't have to you know play dodge traffic and all that kind of stuff getting here. So that said, we're continuing our series today on uh, Are You Happy? And, and so I got to ask, do you want to be happy? Yeah. All right. Hey, this is the first service that actually answered the question more than a couple of people who kind of went, yeah, maybe, uh, I don't know. So we want to be happy. Then understand you have a choice to make. You have a choice to make. Uh, what your plan, what your path is going to take for you to be happy. We kind of started talking about this last week a little bit. But I want you to understand that you are not a passenger on this journey. Now, other people are going to influence your journey. Other people are going to have an effect on your life. We're not telling you that you live in a vacuum But you are the one who decides for your life what you are going to pursue. What's going to be your plan, your approach to trying to live a happy life? So you got to decide, are you going to buy what the world is selling? Are you going to embrace society's definition of happiness and and, kind of adopt one of their plans for success? Or are you going to pursue Jesus? Are you going to trust God and his plan for real blessings, happiness, and contentment? Uh, so that's your choice that you got to figure out what you're going to do. Now, if you're a follower of Jesus, if you believe that Jesus is the Son of God, the Savior of the world, if you believe that he actually died on the cross to pay for your sins and was raised from the dead, and you have made a commitment to follow Jesus, then the choice should be obvious. Now, it's not going to be easy, but it should be obvious. Uh, You know, you ought to say, hey, look, Jesus died for me. He saved me. I'm trusting him to take me to heaven. So I'm going to trust him to lead me to a blessed life. But if you do this, you're going to have to fight against your your own inner urges to sin because, you know, you've been practicing sin for a long time. Your body's addicted to sin. You want to you want to indulge. So it's going to be really tempting to go that direction. It's also Uh, difficult because we've been indoctrinated by our culture, by our society about what happiness is supposed to look like. And we have to fight those urges and those desires to indulge the way that society tells us to be successful. So if you're a follower of Jesus, if you're going to choose to follow Jesus and into happiness and blessings, then it means that you've got to decide or you've got to buy into the crazy ideas of Jesus. Now, some of you are going, wait, you're a preacher and you're calling Jesus' ideas crazy? That's right. And and I know some of you sit in the back because you're afraid I'm going to get struck by lightning one of these days. But but I'm I'm only telling you Jesus' ideas are crazy because the Bible says they're crazy. The Apostle Paul, so I'm in good company, says that the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. But to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. And so when the world looks at the teachings of Jesus, they don't get it. Now, understand, they like the idea of Jesus, but they don't really like the teachings of Jesus. And so when you, they really look at what the Bible says that Jesus said, they, they, uh, they, they call him crazy. 
because they don't make sense. For instance, Jesus, you know, uh, started off this whole, you know, blessed life thing with saying you got to embrace poverty of spirit if you want to be happy. That doesn't really make a whole lot of sense to the world, but that's just a get, getting started. There's lots of insane teachings that Jesus has, like love your enemies. Love your enemies. I mean, what does the world say you should do to your enemies? Destroy them, right? You know, these are people who want to hurt you, who want to punish you, who want to, you know, bring pain into your life. And Jesus says, no, don't destroy them. I want you to love them. Matthew 5, 44. In the same Sermon on the Mount, Jesus said, you've heard it said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Now, if you're sitting there and you're not a follower of Jesus, does that make sense? No. It's crazy. Yeah, it's crazy to love your enemies. But he doesn't stop there. Jesus says that uh, you need to give to be prosperous. Give to be prosperous. Let me get this straight. Prosperity means having an abundance. And Jesus says, if you want to have an abundance, then you need to give away what you have. Hmm. That, but that's what he said. 2 Corinthians 9, 6, the Apostle Paul explaining what Jesus said, uh, tells us this. Whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, but whoever sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. Wow. Because Jesus said, give and it will be given to you. The measure you use will be measured back to you. So if, if you want to get, if you want to be prosperous, then you have to give it away. That's, yeah, that's crazy. Some of you are like going, I, I don't know. It, it, you know, if you tell, try to sell that to the world, they're going to tell you you're crazy. And Jesus said you got to serve to be great. Sort of be great. It's kind of crazy. But, you know, we look at the, the celebrities on TV. We look at the, the, the rich and powerful, the politicians, the businessmen, and, and they are weighted on hand and foot. They're served. They, you know, get the red carpet treatment. They get the, the limo and, and somebody open the door for them and all that kind of stuff that's part of their package. And we equate that, or at least our society equates that with greatness, with power. But Jesus said it's different with you. Matthew 20. He says, it shall not be so among you. You're not like them. But whoever would be great among you must be your servant. And whoever would be first must be your slave. Wow. So Jesus said, greatness isn't about being powerful and being waited on, but instead being the chief servant. Try to sell that to the world. They're going to tell you it's crazy. It's crazy. But the craziest thing Jesus maybe ever said was lose your life to gain life. Lose your life to gain it. Luke 9, 24, Jesus says, for whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. See, the world is all wrapped up in this idea about protecting their life. I mean, they're not really interested in protecting the life of the unborn or, you know, other people, but their life. They, you got to protect their life. And everybody's like, I gotta hang on to it, I gotta preserve it, gotta protect it, you know, I gotta have alarms on my house, gotta have locks in my house, gotta have, you know, people, you know, security, gotta have it all around us, we gotta strap our kids in into the car seats until they're 21, make them wear helmets to the bathroom. Uh, all kinds of crazy stuff, because we're all about preserving life. And Jesus says, you do that and you'll lose it. But if you go ahead and give me your life, you'll find it. You'll save it. You'll have life. Why? Because Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. He says, look, this is where real life resides. And if you get that, not only will I bless your life in this world, but I'll give you eternal life, and you don't have to be afraid anymore. You don't have to be afraid anymore. So real happiness results from pursuing Jesus. Today, do you believe his crazy teachings? So do you believe the crazy teachings of Jesus? Yes. Okay, well, we, got, we had to establish that if we're going to go on in the sermon. Otherwise, we've got to go back and cover some other territory again. <laughs> this is important. Because, because you believe his crazy teachings and you're ready for this. Jesus said, if you want to live a blessed, happy, joyous life, blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Matthew 5, 4. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Wow. You talk about crazy. Jesus says, you want to be happy, then the path lies through grief. Sorrow. Now, 
don't know about you, but that doesn't sell well in today's world because, you know, we're Americans. We just want to take a pill and be happy, right? We want the easy way out. We grew up on stories that ended with, and they all lived happily ever after. And we just want the happily ever after stuff, you know, because the story had a little bit of intensity, a little bit of pain, and then happily ever after. That's funny because most of our lives never get to the happily ever after part. We just have the intensity and pain, right? And we keep thinking about that, wanting that. And Jesus says, look, you can have it, but it goes through grief. Now, understand, please, that God doesn't want you living in depression, misery, and hopelessness. That's not his plan. He doesn't want you residing in a place of hopelessness. But we have to pass through and visit the place of grief in order to be happy. And so what I want to take the rest of the time to talk about is this mourning process that I think Jesus is talking about. Blessed are those who mourn. The mourning process. Now, right away, before we go any further, i got to make sure that you guys understand that word mourning because there's a you in it. Because some of you right now are going, oh, he's talking about mourning process. I love mornings. I like to get up early and make coffee, and I get to sing around the house and annoy all the people who are still sleeping. And, and I'm like, hey, it's 6 o'clock. Get up. we got to go. The whole day is wasting. If you're one of those kind of people, repent. Uh, <laughs> look, God made you that way. I'll blame him, okay? You know, the other half of us equate morning with morning, you know. They're, we're just like, hey, um, uh, I'm at 930 because this is the early service in my world. And, uh, and that Saturday afternoon, evening thing sounds really good because then I don't have to get up. And, and uh, you know, I don't talk to me until I've had my coffee or my Diet Pepsi or whatever it is that you, you need to get going. But, but that's not what we're talking about. We're, this is not time of day kind of stuff. We're talking about mourning, grief, sorrow. And, and, and here's the thing. When Jesus talks about blessed are those who mourn, he's talking about a process by which we live our lives that takes us to a place of blessing. And, and I want to describe the steps on this process because this is something that we need to learn if we're followers of Christ so that we can do it more than once. This is an ongoing kind of process, and, and it's not something you necessarily have to do every day, but you have to do it on a regular basis in your life, and as you do it, it's going to lead you to that place of blessing that Jesus is talking about. So four steps I'm going to cover, and by the way, these are not like you do one and forget about the others. This is, you got to go all the way through the process to get there, okay? Step one is you got to see your sin. We need to see our sin. 1 John chapter 1, verse 8 says, If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth isn't in us. If we say that we're not sinners, that we're really uh, in that place of being right all the time, then, then we're deceiving ourselves. We're lying to ourselves and the truth isn't in us. Wow. Our journey to blessing begins with recognizing our condition. That we are sinners, that we have rebelled against God, that we have defied God, that we are disobedient children. So do you see your sin? Do you see your sin? Because, you know, it's really easy to see other people's sin, isn't it? It's really easy to see your spouse's sin. And I hope you're not pointing it out on a daily basis. It's really easy to see your kid's sin, right? It's really easy to see other people's sin who aren't like you and that you don't like. Oh, look what they're doing. Those people are, oh, can you believe they do that? That's disgusting. But it's difficult to see our own sin. Do do you pick up the word of God, which is the mirror for our soul, and allow God to show you who you really are? Do you see your sin? Now, some of you see your sin really well, and, and maybe even too well. You know, because you're kind of like, oh, I see it. You're always seeing it, and, and, and you're grieving it all the time. And, and we'll talk about that in a little bit because there's some things I need to say to you. But right now, if you struggle to see your sin, then maybe you need to sit down with a piece of paper and do like an inventory of your sin. Let's make up a new word. Let's call it a sin inventory. And uh, <laughs> you just need to take a sin inventory. You need to sit down and go, okay, what are my habits? What are my patterns in my life that are just really displeasing to God and are hurting the people around me or hurting me? And write those down and acknowledge them, see them. And what are the words that I'm using that not only dishonor God, but that hurt the people that hear them? And write those down and acknowledge those. And what are the thoughts that I'm thinking and the desires that I have within my heart that are evil and are destructive to me and displeasing to God? 
And, and by the way, we uh, all have those thoughts. We all have those desires. We all, they're, they're in us because we're sinners, and, and they're present in our lives. Go ahead and acknowledge what they are so that you can see your sin. Because if we don't see our sin, we're going to live in one or two places. If we don't see our sin, we're going to be captured by our sin. It's going to own us and it's going to ruin our lives and lead us into destruction. And we're going to be slaves to that sin if we don't see it. The other place that we end up if we don't see our sin is that we become legalistic religious jerks. Because we see everybody else's sin and we're really quick to point out everybody else's sin and we want to condemn everybody else for how they're living their life. You ever been around one, somebody like that? See, I've been in lots of churches where they were the people running the church. And nobody was good enough and, and you got to change this and you got to do that. And I'm, I'm like you, I don't like anybody telling me how I have to live my life except God. And, and even then, that's a struggle to say, okay, he's right and I'm wrong. But I don't want to be around those people who see everybody else's sin but don't see theirs. And Jesus didn't either because he told the story in, you know, in Matthew 7 where he said, hey, if you want to take the speck out of your brother's eye, take the log out of your own eye first. Don't be a log head. Take your log out and see your sin. And here's the truth. When you see your sin, you, are, you don't want to condemn other people because you know how guilty you are. When you see your own sin, you are a person of far more grace because you know that you deserved every bit of condemnation you want to announce for somebody else. So today, do you see your sin? Because if you want to be blessed, you got to see your sin, and then you got to grieve your sin. you got to grieve your sin. 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 18 and 19 says, Knowing that you were ransomed from the feudal way of life inherited from your forefathers, not with perishable things such as silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, like that of a lamb without blemish or spot. You were rescued from your sin by Jesus and his death. You were bought from hell by Jesus suffering on the cross. We need to understand that so that we can grieve our behavior, so we can grieve the sins, so that we can understand the price that God paid to rescue us. What, what it means is this, literally. Jesus was nailed to the cross because of my pride. The crown of thorns was shoved onto his head because of my lust and my greed. The scourging that he took was to pay for, for my gluttony and my laziness. He shed his blood to cover up my selfishness to forgive me of all of that, and the same is true of you. Do you understand the price that God paid to rescue you from hell, and do you grieve your sin? Here's what it looks like if you don't. You ever caught your child doing something they weren't supposed to be doing? You know, the proverbial hand in the cookie jar. And you started having that discussion about what they did wrong, and they're not hearing you? Yeah, you know, where you sit there and go, okay, um, do you understand why I'm upset with you? And they just look at you and go, nope. Now, what does that do to your blood pressure at that moment? What does it do to your, you know, you're like, okay, I can't hit them. Uh, so, and say spank them. I say you can't hit them. And, and, and you're just like, you get tense because you want them to understand what they did wrong. And they're just like, nope. Or when you say, okay, you need to say you're sorry to your brother or to your sister, right? And they go, sorry. <laughs> because you can't make them mean it, right? But you want them to mean it. You want them to understand what they've done and, and, and grieve that and repent. That defiant child is how a lot of times we are towards God. You know, you know your, what your kid is saying when, they are, when they're like that, when they don't really mean when they're saying sorry. They're not sorry for what they did. They're sorry that they... Yeah. How many times do we know that we're doing something wrong and we're not really sorry for it, but we're sorry that we got caught? See, that's the difference of grieving for your sin and just knowing your sin. My youngest daughter, she... Uh, she was so quick to repent that you had to sneak up on her to discipline her. I mean, if we were going to pop her on the bottom, we had to sneak up on her. Because as soon as you just go, Alyssa, she would just like burst into tears and immediately go, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to do it. 
and not sounding just like that, but um, you know. But there were tears. She was quick to repent. And some of you are sitting here, and as soon as you're aware of your sin, you are quick to repent, and you are grieving your sin all the time. And there's others of you, literally, that are sitting here going, sorry. If you want to take that journey to blessing by mourning, then you have to see your sin, and you have to grieve your sin. And then that leads us to confess our sin. Confess our sin. 1 John 1, 9 says, If we confess our sins, He, God, is faithful and righteous and will forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Confession is agreeing with God that He's right and you're wrong. It's literally saying, Father, I understand that what I did disappointed you. I understand what I did uh, offended you. I understand what I did broke your commands. I'm sorry and I want to change. I want you to change me. I don't want to live this life. I don't want to be that person. I want to be different. Help me to be different. That's confession. You're right, I'm wrong. Change me. And did you notice what happens when we confess? There's two things that happen. What does God do when we confess? He forgives and he cleanses. He forgives us and he cleanses us. He says you're not guilty and he wipes away all of the stain of our sin. He says you're not guilty. Now that's cool. That, that ought to make, go, make you go, wow, look at that. When we confess, then God's pardon flows to you and his grace just pours out into your life and, and you are completely and totally forgiven. So, those of you that really struggle with this whole forgiveness part, you know, you, you see your sin and you grieve really, really well, and, and you confess, understand that today you need to go ahead and forgive yourself because God Almighty knows more than you and he forgives you. Get that? If you hold on and you keep wallowing in the misery of, of I, but I, I failed and I, and I messed up and stuff like that, and you don't, embrace the forgiveness, then what you're saying is, God, your standards aren't high enough. And my judgment is better than your judgment. And by the way, that's idolatry. And, and you're like, yes, yeah, something else for me to grieve about. I need to. No, go ahead and embrace grace because you are forgiven. God declares that. And I understand forgiveness doesn't mean that, that our sinful actions of our past aren't significant or don't have consequences. They do. God does not rescue us from being stupid. He rescues us from hell so that we don't have to live with the consequences of our stupidity forever. You're still going to have to live with the pain of some of your choices. But here's what forgiveness does. It means that, that God accepts you and he begins to rebuild your life based on you following him and he leads us into blessings. That's redemption. Redemption. That's what it looks like as God restores and rebuilds our lives. And, and, and that's why we're not afraid to tell our stories of life change here at Calvary. That, that's why we're not afraid to tell you that here's who we were and here's how God changed us. And we're new people now and here's how God is rebuilding our lives out of the mistakes, out of the brokenness, out of the, the stupidity of yesterday. And see, that place of, of seeing our sin and grieving our sin and confessing our sin leads us to the place where we can rejoice in forgiveness. See, this is, how, this is how blessed are those who mourn works because we go through the mourning process and it ends up in the rejoicing place. We're forgiven of all of our sins. That's the good news of the gospel. We deserve hell and condemnation, but we are getting heaven because of Jesus and acceptance because of him. That's the good news. That's why we celebrate. That's why we sing. That's why Chris dances like a spaz up here when he's playing. All of that's happening because we get this idea that we're guilty, but we're forgiven. And we want to live in that joy because this is the path to the blessed and happy life. But so many of us don't get to step four. I've noticed that, being around Christians. And I've noticed that being in church. That a lot of us, we, we get the whole, I see my sin, I grieve my sin, I confess my sin. But we don't get to the joy part. We don't get to the forgiveness, celebration part. And I don't, and I don't understand that. And so let me just uh, share with you why I think some of us are stuck at step three. Because we only take it halfway. Confess your sins 
uh, to God, and we do that. You know, he's faithful and righteous to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. But a lot of us aren't rejoicing because we're working too hard hiding who we really are. We come to church and we're really hoping that nobody finds out who we used to be. Whether who we used to be was 20 years ago or yesterday. We're afraid that the people around us are going to discover that we're sinners and they're going to discover what sins that we've committed and then they're going to reject us and, and, and not want to be around us. I have a little secret for you. The people sitting around you are just as evil as you are. Okay? Because we're all sinners. We're all separated from God. And it's all just degrees after that. And so the people sitting around you, they've, they've got stories just as messed up as yours in their own way. So just go ahead and understand that. And here's the thing. Confession involves two things. Confessing to God so that he forgives us and we know that, that we're good before him. But it also involves us. James 5.16 says, Confess your sins one to another and pray for each other that you may be healed. And, and what I want to invite you to do is today is, is really start thinking about what that means in your life. It means that you stop trying to hide, stop trying to keep secrets, stop worrying about what people discover because when you confess, you're not afraid anymore. So you find out, I've already told you who I am. I already told you what I'm like. I've already told you what God's forgiven me for. And then you get to start focusing on the rebuilding rather than the mistakes. And it gets rid of those burdens of shame and guilt that we're lugging around with us because, boy, we wish we hadn't done that 20 years ago. We wish we hadn't done that 10 years ago. We wish we hadn't done that last week. Because you acknowledge your sin. You see it for what it is. You grieve it. You confess it. And you embrace the forgiveness of Jesus Christ. So whether your sins were long ago or whether they were yesterday, are you willing to go ahead and be comfortable saying, this is who I am, and God has set me free from that. I'm on a journey towards joy, towards forgiveness, towards life as God builds it up in me again. Uh, can I be honest? That's why we tell the stories up here. We're not afraid to confess. We're not afraid to, and I know some of you are like going, I love the stories. Don't ever ask me to do that. <laughs> we will. Don't worry about it. Once we find out. Because I'm going to tell you something. Once you do that, once you tell your story, it's free. You're free. And you're unafraid. And in freedom is where the joy comes. So some of you, you're never going to need to tell the story up here. But what about in your life group? What about in your family? What about in your circle of friends? Will you risk that much and see if God won't bring healing and hope to your life? And get you over that hump so that on this journey of Morning, you can rejoice in forgiveness. Because here's what I know happens when we really, you know, give ourselves to God and this honesty about who we are and, and all that kind of stuff is that God shows up when we repent. God shows up when we repent. We don't have to be afraid because here's what happens. You come to God as that disobedient, rebellious child and you say, I see my sin, I grieve my sin, I confess my sin. And God doesn't get angry and knock us around a little bit. What he does at that point is he takes us in his arms and he holds us close and he says, I'm glad you're my child. I love you. I forgive you. I'm going to bless you. That's what it means when it says, blessed are those who mourn for they shall be comforted. It means that you're going to know God's joy and peace up close in that intimate love relationship that all of us desire with our creator. So are you going to take that journey today? Are you going to go ahead and take that step? Because if you do, God's going to bless. Because Jesus is the one who said, Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Will you pray with me? Father, we love you. And we are still amazed that you love us. Just like we are broken, messed up people. You love us in the midst of our rebellion. You love us in the midst of our poor choices. And, and today we just want to come to you seeing our sin, grieving our sin, and confessing it because we want to live in the joy of forgiveness. We want to know that love relationship intimately. So God, give us the courage to step past the fear of discovery and to embrace this lifestyle of confession knowing that you're going to forgive us and trusting our friends and our church family to forgive us also. Change our lives. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.
Let's stand and worship our God.